Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thanks, uh, Professor Leslie Pau and uh, Professor Evan uh, Talk uh, and also Akaya uh, for uh, joining us uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, panel. Uh, if, unfortunately, Akaya is not uh, uh, present, but uh, he wrote the paper with uh, Evren. Uh, it's uh, now 7 a.m. in uh, Sao Paulo, and we are starting early today with policy diffusion. Uh, this is the second week of the conference, and you can watch all the previous panels here in this YouTube channel. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, other colleagues that uh, were uh, prepared sent us proposals to this panel couldn't uh, uh, attend uh, the panel. Uh, and we will have only one presentation, which is uh, the presentation of the pe pe paper of uh, 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 Professor uh, Evren Talk and uh, uh, Abdullah Akaya. The paper is called The Gulf Cooperation Council States a Crystallization of the Regional Cooperation and Alliance Amid Dwindling Resources. Um, before inviting uh, Evren to talk, I will say a few words about this panel. Uh, and uh, after uh, Evren's presentation, uh, Professor Paul uh, is going to uh, say some general reflections on the topic of the panels. And afterwards, we will open the, the floor to uh, questions and comments from the audience. Uh, if you uh, want to make a comment or a question, please uh, uh, write it on our YouTube uh, chat. Everything is going to be recorded, and if you uh, and and uh, in the in this conference, and you can watch it later at any time uh, from anywhere. So, to start with uh, this panel, uh, when we first thought about uh, uh, this, uh, 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 Les and I acknowledged that. Uh, there was a very little discussion about the role of the small states in policy diffusion. In spite of uh, uh, their uh, engagement and use of a skilled diplomacy uh, in international relations. For example, uh, an example of key skilled diplomacy is, uh, for example, Qatar hosting the World Cup without uh, being an important figure on the, import the football scene or Singapore that became a model for multicultural policies, uh, exporting its ideas across uh, the world. Uh, we were also thinking about emerging relations of development corporations involving policy transfers, as for example, the engagement of Brazil uh, with different countries and small states in the South. Uh, the case of Haiti offers an in interesting example. In so far as Brazil had uh, an important peacekeeping oper operation in Haiti, and under this umbrella, uh, it intensified the, the list of activities uh, of um, uh, uh, cooperating with uh, Haiti. And uh, uh, the development cooperation Brazil offered was uh, in part uh, to transfer social policies, social technologies developed here in Brazil uh, to uh, Haiti. In another direction, uh, Brazil also strengthened its relations with uh, Lusophone countries and had, for example, different agreements with uh, Green Cape in, uh, in, Afro in Africa. Uh, some of these agreements included uh, the transfer of housing policies to uh, to green, green, green Cape. Of course, uh, Brazil is not a small country, but it got into the international game, increasing its cooperations with such uh, states. Uh, so we wanted uh, to bring to the light, the spotlight, these sorts of elements, uh, the role uh, and the participation of uh, small states in policy transfer, in development cooperation, to the discussion, and we created this panel. And uh, now we have the opportunity to uh, move even further this uh, reflection uh, with uh, the, the, the work that was proposed by uh, Evren. And uh, we also uh, have the opportunity to include other cases, examples, and uh, think more about uh, such a phenomena. So that said, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Evren to uh, to present his paper. Uh, the paper, as I said before, 
is uh, in, entitled The Gulf Cooperation Council States Crystallization of the Regional Cooperation and Alliances Amid Drilling uh, Resources. So thank you everyone for being here today, for watching this uh, uh, panel session. And uh, I would like to uh, invite now uh, Evan, Professor Evan Talk uh, to um, uh, present his uh, uh, paper. Evren, uh, I think your 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 mic your, your mic is on on mute. Can you hear me now? It's it's uh, so you can hear me now. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I was just saying that um, I feel really like uh, I feel really um, opportunate and also like quite uh, grateful to be in a position to uh, be part of this amazing uh, platform. Uh, I believe the website and your initiative, uh, the last time we were uh, in Singapore and uh, I remember um, the, the process of uh, building the website and everything. So I'm really glad to be and happy to be part of this framework. So thanks to their Osmani for making this possible. And also special thanks to Professor Lesepel for his wisdom and inspiration. Uh, I think it's young, uh, relatively young scholars of uh, public policy and analysis. His, his inspiration has been so um, strong and I really appreciate that. So um, this study, uh, the paper that has been published, um, while I was having some preliminary talks with uh, Professor Pell, uh, I was uh, I, I was under the impression that the um, the audience may be uh, in need of some level of like background for uh, for the Gulf region. So um, and I I didn't want to just kind of like um, repeat the paper and its argument, uh, but I assumed that many colleagues have read it and or had a chance to review it partially or skim it. What I want to do today is to kind of uh, take a step back and look at the kind of the precursors of why I had the need or I had the kind of like a kind of uh, um, the kind of academic and policy related um, kind of uh, motive to, to kind of engage in this area because to be perfectly honest, the paper doesn't reflect what I wanted to achieve in, in the first stage. And I will show you um, like the process itself, uh, um, going back to 2013 and 14, when I first uh, started to think about um, South-South cooperation and uh, policy learning and diffusion, um, especially from a uh, Arabian Gulf, or some people call it Persian Gulf. I think the correct version is Persian Gulf perspective. So, um, and I will present that as well. I will try to give you the kind of the uh, the backstage of this work. And also the other intention is to create a bit more affinity and acquaintance in terms of some of the inner dynamics that are absolutely different from uh, the other regions. Uh, as it kind of contains a lot of uh, politics uh, that has been affecting the um, the Gulf states and in uh, considerable ways. And, um, and the third intention is for the future, I really want to be able to write um, another article, uh, maybe collectively engage in a project that I can integrate uh, the literature on policy diffusion 
uh, and better able to connect and study some of the um, the practices uh, that are happening from that angle. Um, because as I will show you, uh, this study is more from the perspective of, I, get, I think, soft power perspective. And um, and on my screen, you might, uh, you, you, you are seeing some keywords about this uh, study uh, and my presentation. Some of them are about like regionalism, South-South Corporation, Arab Spring, Blockade in 2017, and the issue of ideology. And uh, on the screen, I'm not seeing, I'm not sure how legible or how easy to identify uh, what's happening on the screen. But can anybody guess this background on the screen? Maybe you can write on the chat. I just want to kind of like understand if my reasoning was correct or not. What does it resemble, like the background on the screen? Any ideas? Nope. There must be at least one idea. I mean, just a suggestion. You can guess what's on the screen. Uh, sound studio? No. Okay, it's a it's a control room. Control panel, actually, it's a huge control panel. Uh, missile launch. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Pal's suggestions are actually quite nice. It's a control room, um, and uh, it could be the control room for, uh, like, I'm a security system, or, and uh, it could be the control room of of a, a ship. I don't know, but it's a control room, and I wanted to use this metaphor to show that. Um, in in the in the region, um, the way policy diffusion could be understood is is quite related to controlling or perpetuating the the, the regime. So um, so the dynamics that are institutional and organizational and post related dynamics that are taking place in the region and by the um, the, the states of the Gulf Cooperation Council um, are pretty much about. The concept of control. That is why I wanted to use this control room. Is everything controlled perfectly? Can they can they control all the kind of the, the dynamics, endogenous and exogenous factors perfectly? No, it's not the case. But on a separate front, there is a quite deal of um, necessity uh, and demand by the governments to be able to uh, control their population and also at the same time um the state sponsored um state so uh, market uh society relationships and uh, uh capitalist class as well as well as the general uh, society so it's a control room and i think um if anybody wants to understand uh policy diffusion in the region uh control is is, is one of the keywords i believe um that was my point uh so when we talk about GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council states, we are basically talking about six different countries, uh, namely uh, the, the largest one is, is Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, and Oman. Um, and as you can easily see, the, the smallest of these countries in terms of size is Bahrain, the largest is Saudi Arabia, and Qatar is somewhere in between. And um, and uh, the uh, the emergence of GCC as an institutional uh, artifact is first signed in 1981, um, and it was promoted initially as a form of uh, um, regional expression of pan pan Arabism, and uh, the royals of the six states uh, they wanted to promote. Uh, cooperative security and encourage coordination, especially economic coordination in the region. And um, one element of the charter indicated that uh, <clears throat> the organization of GCC uh, was to um, coordinate, integrate, and interconnect between member states and to formulate uh, similar regulations 
to enhance cooperation in economic and financial affairs, commerce, customs, communication, education, culture, and stimulate scientific and technological progress. Uh, this was by the Secretary General of GCC 1981. Um, and this formal agreement arguably shaped the dynamics of state market relations in the Gulf uh, going forward more than the long-standing but fraying security for oil bargain with the United States in the post-hydrocarbon uh, hydrocarbon price boom. Um, one critical word that, uh, that we need to mention here is the concept of Haliji. Uh, Haliji means uh, the shared sense of uh, Arabian Gulf identity. Uh, some people call it the Haliji Gulf. Uh, and uh, this shared sense of Haliji identity, it represents this kind of this uh, Persian Gulf six countries that they are not only coming together as a form of um, institutional identity, but also they are they are they are part of this because of their commonality in terms of their uh, culture and also um, sense of belonging and um, so on a separate front of course one needs to identify that there are some similar economic structures and characteristics based on hy hydrocarbon exports similar experiences of rapid economic development and industrialization uh, beginning in the 1970s uh, and uh, sh shared rentier and allocation state systems uh, which spared them from the poverty creating symptoms of the resource curse and because and became the vehicle to legitimize the state uh, state regimes uh, the formation of the GCC expressed the belief that uh, this group of states shared a common identity and made them natural allies which compelled them to cooperate to further shared interests and uh, foster economic uh, and political regional interdependency. Um, and it was pretty much like a, a symbolic boundary, like uh, the, the national boundaries were at that time, actually in the past, were more about the symbolic boundaries, the marketial lines. Uh, and political economist Adam Henie uh, explained that the um, when he characterized Haliji, uh, he says it goes beyond the geographic meaning to convey a common pan Arab, pan Gulf Arab identity that sets the people um, of the region apart from the rest of the Middle East. And the Haliji capitalism describes a class of elites whose accumulation is most thoroughly and consistently grounded in the internationalization of capital across the GCC space. Uh, and of course, this capitalism is hierarchical structured around the Saudi Emirati axis uh, with other capital connected in a subordinate fashion to, to this core. Um, this identity, of course, is not undisputed. There are important disputes uh, when it comes to this identity. Uh, like even if you go back to 19, early 1980s, when this was the first uh, 1981, first summit when the, the charter was uh, established, uh, it has never been uh, like, a, like a complete uh, harmony between the states. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia is the largest economy and hosting two important Islamic sites for the, the, uh, as a religion of Islam. Um, the, uh, the others, uh, historically, UAE and Qatar, uh, tried to kind of um, represent a pushback against Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, assumption of hegemony. Uh, and one good example of uh, historical discrepancies between these countries, despite the formation of GCC, has been uh, uh, that the problem is I can I just see the kind of the um, the comment about camera, but the problem is I have three uh, three three uh, screens in front of me, so uh, I don't know where to look at. That's the problem. I have my iPad connected to the other one, etc. So, 
uh, yeah, so uh, the, the monetary union uh, has been one of the problems uh, that has been historically uh, an area of a battlefield, which actually uh, the idea of creating a single currency uh, failed in 2019. Um, and um, and also the the the, the, the uh, border problems have always been areas of problems actually between these states, um, and uh, and of course we have to understand that these states have historically been engaged in forms of um, modernization, and uh, their modernization paths created different forms of micro nationalisms that started to create ruptures between these states. And, uh, and these micro-identities or um, micro-nationalisms also created um, like some sort of like uh, fragilities uh, among the relationship between uh, these countries. So if we understand in today's world uh, what went wrong uh, in terms of uh, like the, the recent history of um, uh, the Arabian Gulf, we have to look into five major turning points, I guess. Maybe four of them is, is more important because the fifth one is so recent. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> it is the, uh, the Arab Spring process, uh, which was uh, definitely a game changer and it affected these countries to a great extent in terms of uh, the way they start to build their alliances and relationships. So 2010 and 11 represent the, uh, the start, the commencement of the Arab Spring. And, uh, sorry. And, um, and then afterwards, uh, 2014 is a critical time because uh, in 2014, we have seen the first uh, symptom of uh, a regional uh, dispute in the sense that um, the Emirates, uh, Bahrain and uh, Saudi, they withdrew their ambassadors from Qatar uh, and accused Qatar for supporting organizations that are uh, working against the interests of uh, these countries. So this was uh, called the, the December um, 2014, the first diplomatic crisis that happened. And um, 2017, as you may all know, uh, it's the time when um, the blockade uh, by uh, the three members of the GCC, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and United, United Arab Emirates, the blockade started and later Egypt, uh, joined these uh, this uh, uh, countries and they became commonly known as the uh, the uh, the quarte uh, the blockading quarte against Qatar. 2019 is the time, as you all know, uh, COVID-19 uh, started all over, uh, and then it kind of pretty much affected the entire 2020. And this, of course, created uh, an additional pressure on the countries of the Gulf. Um, which needs to be, by the way, analyzed in so many different ways, especially in terms of the way they responded to uh, this uh, health crisis. And 2021 is basically uh, the time uh, when uh, the blockade more or less uh, came to an end, um, although not 100% result, but mostly came to an end with uh, an agreement called El Ula Agreement, and with the GCC summit in, in, in Riyadh. So this photograph that I will show you uh, here pretty much represents uh, what happened in January 2021. The, the six Gulf states after a long time uh, got together um, in, uh, in the same room and uh, pretty much in 1981, when, when things started in 1981, as I showed you, they were together and now they are back again together. But uh, of course, uh, we have to be kind of cognizant of important uh, factors, especially the Arab Spring. Still, uh, the disputes and the kind of the, the major differences between these countries are still uh, taking place. And, um, and the countries of Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Bahrain, Syria, Yemen, 
as well as Algeria and Sudan, uh, these countries uh, are still uh, affected by the in some in varying levels, of course, and the relationship with the the Gulf is, is still um, fragile, uh, and not only fragile but also uh, creating new groupings and alliances uh, that I wanted to kind of um, describe uh, in this paper. Uh, one critical element, one of my um, uh, former studies, actually, I also wanted to look into the area of diversification. Um, and I believe this is uh, an important element, especially uh, state-led entrepreneurship that, that represents uh, the, the way uh, capital system is um, structured here uh, in, in the Gulf, that uh, diversification uh, in the economy is, is slow and it's not um, happening the way it's envisioned for many reasons. Creation or establishment of like an entrepreneurial uh, class is not really taking place because most of the entrepreneurial uh, investments and, and the, the government's diversification is happening through state channels and it doesn't help much with the um, uh, in terms of creation of like a, a more middle class entrepreneurial middle class so um next one um let me go back to the beginnings uh to tell you that this was just a kind of a brief about the gulf and i wanted to kind of uh, give you uh, like a broad picture of like where does the kind of the major problems uh, where do the major problems come from where do they stem from um when I attended this conference in um, February 2014, I was quite uh, adamant in studying this South-South uh, uh, cooperation models and modalities and practices uh, that are being agreed on in this interesting um, event. I attended almost all sessions and discussed in detail with many officials uh, and this was the first Arab States Regional South-South Development Expo. And uh, it was quite um, hopeful in terms of the way it was structured because uh, many forms of South-South cooperation have been discussed in detail. And having UNDP and UN Office for South-South Cooperation uh, backing this event, uh, it, was, it was quite fruitful in terms of the way um, some of the agreements were undertaken. And uh, if I show you in more detail, uh, during the event, uh, there were many discussions about agricultural development, triangular cooperation, enhancing of food security, especially food security was taking, uh, a, it took uh, hours of uh, like um, meetings and uh, discussions because um, as you know, Qatar is uh, a food insecure country and uh, around 90% of the food is being uh, imported. And um, in 2014, uh, um, one of the uh, programs in Qatar that has been built was called uh, QNFBA, which was Qatar uh, National Food Security Program. And the Qatar National Food Security Program uh, had many sessions actually in, in this um, in this in this event about uh, partnering or about um, doing investments abroad, either in Sudan, in in other some uh, sub uh, sub-Saharan African countries, to absorb their practices and also uh, transferring some of the kind of practices of vertical farming, aquaponics, hydroponics, and so on and so forth. So so many quite technical uh, subjects were being discussed. Uh, to enhance food security in Qatar, um, and and many many of the uh, big farms right now that are operating in Qatar, like the El Sidra farm, the Balatna or Slaty farms, like right now, if um, every day a million flowers are being produced in Qatar, and many actually vegetables or fruits are being produced now in Qatar, I believe uh, it it goes back to this kind of the time of um, uh, having these kind of learning mechanisms uh, at that time. Uh, secondly, uh, you see a lot of areas about energy security, uh, technologies and uh, women's employment. 
uh, gender equality. And these areas are quite uh, common when, when you talk about South-South cooperation. And uh, having Qatar in, in, in this format actually at that time was quite, uh, quite uh, inspiring. So, and then what happened, as I told you, end of the same year, you saw, and we all witnessed the, the, the first uh, diplomatic crisis uh, when uh, the, the three uh, the college GCC member states, they withdrew their ambassadors from Qatar. So uh, my first idea was how can we study uh, these uh, forms of uh, policy transfer adoption or emulation and whatever they are, because I like they they had to be studied, you know, um, at, at that time. Uh, but it was not that easy because most of these projects were, uh, again, like not easy to kind of get uh, data and uh, delve into the areas. So uh, at the same time, I was very interested in observing on the ground what what are some of this institutional um, kind of and uh, organizational dynamics taking place on the ground? Uh, so I applied uh, with Professor um, Tim Shaw from University of Massachusetts and uh, Haini Besada from United Nations South-South uh, Cooperation Department. We applied for a research grant and we proposed to study uh, a Qatari perspective and economic diversification uh, through governance of natural resources in sub-Saharan Africa. This was a, like a, a three and a half year grant that we have received and we have visited 12 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So the idea was to look into the ways Qatar has been instrumental in creating capacity uh, in, 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 in sub-Saharan African um, region, especially uh, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, in, uh, in Kenya, in, um, in Togo, Mali, Mauritania, uh, and um, and uh, I think I mentioned Ethiopia as well. But overall, Sierra Leone was one of the countries I visited. So in all these countries, Qatar has been doing uh, plenty of investments, and these investments were uh, in a different way following the political um, nature of Qatar's uh, relationships, or let's say. Uh, they were pretty much following the, the foreign policy priorities of Qatar. Uh, and, um, and not all of them represented uh, learning or capacity building. Although Qatar had a strong um, areas uh, to export its learning, uh, for instance, um, if you think about uh, the long standing experience of Qatar in terms of um, hydrocarbon sector and the drilling and uh, high stream, low stream uh, channels of um, uh, like uh, oil production, oil and gas production. Uh, many African countries like Angola and Nigeria, which also produce oil, they can they could have easily borrowed Qatar's uh, experience in so many different ways, but I have realized this has never happened. So, uh, but what we were able to uh, accomplish was uh, some of the investments in, in terms of uh, water, energy, food nexus, we were able to investigate and we were able to study some of the, um, the governance models that are in place and, and the decisions behind uh, choosing these locations. Um, some of the minerals and uh, some of the investments Qatar has been doing. Uh, but of course, it's, it's the topic of another presentation. Um, and if you ask me whether uh, we have learned a lot, not really, because um, Qatar's investment or Qatar's engagement in sub-Saharan Africa um, requires a, a, a bit of more like a soft power engagement more than economic investment style or learning. At that time, uh, in the same years, we have started this book, which is published last year, uh, Innovating South-South Cooperation. And my thinking was to, uh, to study Qatar's uh, engagement in Africa and then afterwards uh, try to make sense of what are some of the innovative forms of South-South uh, cooperation that can be learned from the, 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 the Gulf experience in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, not only in Qatar, but if you look at Arab Emirates, especially in uh, Djibouti or some other uh, countries like Eritrea and, uh, and uh, Senegal and others, you see, a, or Cameroon, uh, you see a strong Gulf engagement in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in Somalia, for instance, in Somaliland, it's, you can see 
a very strong Gulf engagement in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we wanted to study originally these, but apparently uh, the book turned out to be more like a conceptual uh, with case studies coming from Indonesia, China, India, Brazil, uh, partially from Turkey. And, um, and then uh, I shifted my focus to uh, the development cooperation and I try to study the Gulf donors and their behaviors. Uh, and why I'm, I'm bringing this up? Because uh, when it comes to South-South cooperation, uh, it, it, the way we understand it in terms of capacity building, um, it, does, it didn't take place. So I, I wondered if development aid could be understood and analyzed as a form of uh, learning and diffusion. Uh, in this case, it's not uh, the case because um, for many reasons, uh, the, the development aid of Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi and Emirati, they also follow uh, their foreign policies. And in this paper, I try to locate and compare and contrast uh, the Gulf donors vis-a-vis -vis, uh, OECD DAC countries and also uh, classical um, or the conventional understandings of South-South uh, cooperation models. And uh, one interesting fact about uh, trends, let's say, about uh, Gulf development uh, cooperation model was that it doesn't fit into neither DAC nor um, South-South cooperation models. It's, it is somewhere in between. Uh, and it is it represents qualities of certain qualities of DAC model and certain qualities of uh, South South cooperation. But historically, especially in the recent years, because of the oil oil, oil prices and others and diminishing role of um, diminishing uh, financial resources, their uh, aid has been decreasing. And we have been seeing uh, the shift away from uh, bilateral to multilateral aid. So not, unlike the past, uh, Gulf states are supporting the UN entities more than providing bilateral aid to, uh, to countries. And of, of, often people accused Gulf countries to only support uh, 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 countries with, uh, that are constitutionally Islamic or Muslim majority countries. But it's also no longer true because uh, if you look at uh, Qatar's work or Emirati's work, as opposed to being development actors, they are more uh, supporters of humanitarian aid and they have been uh, supporting many countries, Islamic or non-Islamic, uh, and uh, they have been changing their focus also from high level infrastructure projects to projects that are smaller in scale. Uh, but uh, again, if you delve, deep into the kind of um, the efficiency and effectiveness of these uh, developmental, developmental models, they are more right now uh, humanitarian uh, style uh, as opposed to South-South um, uh, cooperation style. Um, so the learning and diffusion um, is not really uh, visible. Uh, these are some uh, cases that I kind of try to uh, sh share with you uh, in the in the paper uh, to showcase that although we use the word um, Gulf, Gulf donors or Gulf development uh, perspective or Gulf capitalism, still there are some important differences between these states. Um, and in the article, it is uh, clarified that there is this rich triplet, which is the Qatar, UAE and Kuwait, uh, when you uh, turn things into um, the GDP per capita. And uh, also, if you look at this one, you will see uh, another perspective in terms of central bank assets, sovereign wealth fund per capita, etc. Uh, there is some kind of level, like uh, uh, a big disparity when you compare these uh, countries. But of course, it's not only that uh, economic, but also political. Um, uh, both the Arab Spring uh, 2010 onwards and the 2014 first diplomatic crisis and 17 blockade made it very clear that uh, Qatar is uh, pretty much um, like on its own right now. And uh, Bahrain, uh, Emirates and Saudi Arabia are the, the three countries that are acting together. And Kuwait and Oman are in between 
uh, they have been trying to mediate uh, during the blockade and Kuwait especially played an important role in rectifying the, the largest, uh, the, the most recent crisis. And, um, but again, if you look at their behavior vis-a-vis -vis other states, again, this is what I wanted to uh, make the point about crystallization. So now these uh, Gulf, uh, Arab Gulf states, they have, uh, they have tried to, uh, the, they, they have sidelined with uh, many uh, Middle East and North Africa countries and others like Pakistan uh, and Turkey. Uh, and these uh, crystallizations uh, are still there. Uh, for instance, if you look at the case of Morocco, um, re like, like recently criticized heavily because of um, uh, the agreement between Israel and uh, Emirates, uh, Morocco also sidelined with them, and uh, this has also sparked some other discussions. Uh, again, uh, Sunni Shia uh, sectarian um, uh, fault line is an important factor uh, because it's also it's closely connected with the, the influence of Iran, uh, which is also critically important for the blockade because Qatar used Iranian airspace and Iranian exports to Qatar has been quite important during the blockade. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, some of the thoughts that I've been using was already in, uh, captured in, in the book that uh, I have uh, co-edited with uh, Professor Pell and Lulua al Khatar, especially in the chapter that I was part of. Um, we tried to look into the, uh, the mechanisms of soft power because I believe that right now, if, if anyone wants to understand policy diffusion, we need to be careful in terms of... Uh, delineating policy diffusion with uh, a, a lot of tools and mechanisms of soft power. Um, so the kind of uh, the nexus between foreign policy and political conjuncture, soft policy mechanisms and diffusion, they are quite um, uh, convoluted. And this, this needs a lot of, I believe, uh, contextualizing of the literature on this uh, on policy diffusion and the technicalities of the, uh, the literature in, in in the field in especially in the Arabian Gulf to be able to identify what counts as diffusion here in the region because I'm not very clear about it but I want to study it so um, but there are different forms of soft power that can be used one element that one uh, can understand from here is uh, this is this is mostly for Qatar. So if you look at the soft power and hard power tools of Qatar, what you see is we call it the nested power, and that's more global than regional. So uh, I believe this is an important area. Right now, uh, maybe in the past five, six years, Qatar's global integration using the uh, global networks to, to, to survive, to keep its sustainability, to, you, to, to, to establish new trade routes and to establish new uh, alliances, uh, is not is not unexpected because if you look at the way Qatar has been building its power, it has been. Imagine this was done in 2015, I believe. It has been more global than regional. So uh, it seems that Qatar has been more prepared uh, to a blockade uh, and uh, than other countries, and it has been easier for Qatar to uh, rectify changing um, some uh, trade routes and others. So um, what does it mean in terms of policy diffusion? I believe that Qatar is more open to create more capacity and learn through uh, other countries like Brazil, China, India, uh, Turkey, Iran. Turkey and Iran is already there. But again, these linkages and forms of soft power, uh, to what extent they, they translate into capacity building mechanisms, technical knowledge and learning and diffusion and translation, I'm not sure. It needs further study and any suggestions based on this, I appreciate and I'm willing to undertake this research more and more to bring more the policy diffusion literature into this uh, study. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evan, for this uh, very interesting presentation uh, with uh, lots of uh, elements for uh, us to think about on the, the role of uh, the Qatar and also the, uh, 
uh, uh, of uh, countries in policy diffusion and development cooperation. Uh, I'm going to now uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Leslie Paul to make a few comments on uh, this presentation, as well as on uh, uh, the engagement of small states in uh, policy diffusion and development cooperation. Uh, Professor Paul, please. Thank you, Asmani, and thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Everin, for uh, for a great presentation. Uh, I and um, and thanks very much for the opportunity. And I want to share uh, or, or echo the compliments that uh, Everin uh, forwarded uh, about the about the Diffusion and Development Conference uh, as a whole. It's uh, it's been a wonderful uh, example of how to pivot uh, academic uh, organization and academic conferences in the context of. Um, of COVID, and um, and it's a pleasure. The College of Public Policy, in which I'm I'm currently dean, uh, is contributing in a small has contributed in a small way um, uh, to help support the uh, the conference. So it's uh, the work that Osmani and his colleagues have done is uh, is really quite uh, quite remarkable. I should uh, full disclosure: uh, Osmani and Evren are are two of my uh, collaborators, my favorite colleagues, uh, among my favorite colleagues, and I've uh, I've learned a lot. In the last few years, working with them, I was just reflecting before I uh, before I got on on the screen how much work I've done with uh, with both of them um, just over the last four or five years. So it's quite uh, quite extra <laughs> quite extraordinary. Uh, so they their energy has drawn me into some really amazing projects and uh, and work. And uh, Dr. Evan cited one of them. So um, what you heard from Evan was a, a kind of tour d'horizon of. Uh, both the paper that uh, that is on in, in a formal sense for the discussion today, uh, but also the the range of work that he's been doing on diffusion in Qatar, MENA, uh, Africa, South South cooperation. So there's a lot a lot there, and of course the paper that is uh, again formally on for the panel today uh, actually ended up being published. So uh, I, 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 there's no point in making comments about revision because it's already it's already been uh, been uh, been published. But what I thought I would do is use the um, use the paper as a springboard for some thoughts about small states. As as Osmani said at the beginning in the introduction to the panel, um, the role of small states in policy diffusion is not really Really been explored in any great uh, detail. It kind of, you know, people will refer to different examples that end up being small states. Brazil, you know, we could we could have a discussion or an argument about whether it, it qualifies. Um, but um, you know, so people sometimes make reference to small states, but I don't think the issue of small states in in diffusion has been particularly well theorized. You know, we tend to our defaults tend to be the usual suspects in terms of large international organizations like the OECD or the World Bank, or relatively big states like the US or European states, uh, since they, they simply have the, the, the clout and the, and the weight to do transfer. So uh, the, uh, the, I'm, I'm gonna pose five questions that are related and spring from the, uh, the inspired by, uh, by Everin's paper, five questions about small states and um, and policy diffusion, and hopefully that'll. Uh, I don't have answers to those questions, or maybe I, I've got a few possible reflections or conjectures. But I think the the, the questions are worth asking. There's probably a lot more, but they they were the five that that, uh, that I came up with after reading the uh, the paper. So uh, of those five questions, the first one is perhaps the most obvious in a sense, um, though I think it. It has some subtleties. What actually is a small state? Um, I think our, our intuition is that a small state should be defined in terms of population and geography. Uh, but um, so, it, you know, we take a, if you take a small state like Denmark um, and within the public admin global policy making literature, you know, there's the line about getting to Denmark. But if you want to develop your governance, and systems effectively need to get to Denmark. So Denmark is usually held up as a kind of exemplar of good governance. So it's, but it's a small state, and, um, and but it has a population of just over five million. Uh, Qatar's population is two point seven million. Uh, the uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is one of the GCC countries, and Dr. and and ever mentioned that it's the the biggest of the of the group of six, uh, has a population of thirty four million. Um, it's arguable whether KSA, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, would actually be considered a small state. Um, it's a small state globally, but it's a pretty big actor within the GCC. 
Take a country like New Zealand, it's got uh, 5.1 million people. So I did a quick scan of, uh, of lists of countries by population. And if we take uh, Denmark, New Zealand, in other words, the kind of 5 million threshold in terms of population, uh, there are roughly about 70, 70 countries in the world that, and uh, countries and dependencies that um, qualify for having populations under 6 million. And some of the interesting ones are Singapore, uh, it's 5.6 million, island state, and again, Osmani mentioned it at the outset, Estonia, 1.3 million. Estonia, for those people that do work in digital governance, is uh, kind of the poster child for uh, effective implementation of digital technologies in public policy making and governance, but it's only got 1.3 million people. <clears throat> Bhutan, a, uh, a, uh, a mountain, state uh, next to Nepal, nestled next to Nepal and in, uh, in India, only has a population of 756,000 people. But it has uh, been very effective in policy or diffusion around the idea of happiness uh, and well-being as a measure or standard of, uh, of governance, uh, and indeed is, is renowned or known around the world for having a global or ha having a gross national happiness index as opposed to gross, gross national product. Iceland, um, I, again, island, middle of the Atlantic, um, 626,000 people, so less than a million. Uh, I'm sorry, 368,000. Luxembourg was in, uh, the next one on my list. It's got 626. Uh, Luxembourg uh, is, of course, a financial center, tiny state. Iceland uh, is... Um, I'm not sure whether it's known for any particular kind of diffusion except for being um, uh, a stable and interesting country uh, and uh, its people being relatively well off and happy after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, the U United Kingdom, um, a small state geographically, it has 66 million population, but of course it's uh, it, has, it punches above its weight and even have after Brexit, uh, previous to Brexit within the European Union, but then globally through the legacy of its, its, its uh, Commonwealth and, the, and the, the British Empire. So it's a small, smallish state geographically as well as in population, but um, you know, it has enormous influence in terms of diffusion. And then there's a whole class within the IR, international relations literature on so-called middle powers of which Canada uh, is considered one. Uh, it's got a population of 38 million, but geographically it's the second largest land uh, country landmass in the world. Australia, again, huge uh, geographically, but only 25 million. So I think there's some issues there to discuss about what counts as a small state. Uh, I think a kind of rough uh, benchmark might be populations under 5 million, um, but uh, that would only be a start. And then we have some complexities around what size of populations, uh, geographical size, location, and, and leverage within associations like the European Union, uh, like Luxembourg, uh, or even its role as a global financial uh, center. So I think that's something that would be worth um, some theoretical as well as practical reflection. So that's question one, what counts as a small state? Second question is when can small states in principle have uh, po uh, policy influence and what gives small states uh, the potential for leverage or having um, policy influence. Uh, size, uh, large size um, and large populations do not necessarily guarantee policy influence or transfer capacity. The Democratic Republic of Congo has a population of 106 million people and it's the 14th most populous country in the world. Um, but I don't think anybody would argue that the Congo, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, is a, uh, a leader in terms of policy transfer or, uh, or diffusion. So size uh, of population and geography is not necessarily a, um, uh, a platform or a basis for, for influence. It helps. Um, so what is, uh, I thought of at least three ways in which small states can exercise or have the potential for policy influence. One, it has to be a model of some sort. Um, so Singapore and Estonia. Singapore possibly for bootstrapping its way with a relatively small population of only five or six million people as an island state surrounded by 
huge states, Indonesia, Malaysia, in terms of population. And uh, of course, when it became independent or, or it was uh, kicked out of the Malaysian Federation in 1961, I believe it was, it was the poorest and the worst of the countries in the region. So it's, it's an exemplar of a country that's a small state that has managed somehow to uh, become one of the richest and most developed small states and countries and economies in the world. So how did it do it? So it's a kind of exemplar or a model for that. Uh, Estonia, I've already mentioned digital governance. New Zealand now is considered, I think, generally to have somehow dealt with its COVID problems better than almost anybody else. So it stands out as a as a model for uh, dealing with the pandemic, as did South Korea. So. Um, so being a model in some area of policy uh, can can give a small state its leverage or its position as a potential diffuser of that model. Um, a second reason might be just being useful to large powers. Uh, so Switzerland and Luxembourg um, as small states um, actually have um, uh, been useful for uh, the global capitalist financial system in terms of banking. Uh, so their size uh, has been uh, out, uh, out balanced by their their role in international financial markets, and so they have a disproportionate influence as a model uh, and as players in international financial considerations. Uh, so if you're useful to large powers, uh, you can um, you can uh, end up being a diffuser, have some possibility for being a model. Uh, and then there's a third one, which is uh, strategic importance, and this is more geopolitical. But going back to Everett's paper, the GCC states, think of Saudi Arabia or think of Qatar, um, uh, are for obvious reasons uh, strategically important in the, in the Gulf region, throughout MENA, uh, hydrocarbon production. So they get disproportionate attention, dis irrespective of size, uh, disproportionate uh, attention globally uh, simply because of their strategic importance. So we could imagine, and of course this is part of the paper, uh, Everett's paper with the decline in the importance of hydrocarbon resources as we move beyond hydrocarbon, uh, the strategic importance of the Gulf states is going to decline and consequently their capacity to be diffusers of or, or examples of transfer uh, is going possibly to decline as well. So that was the second question. When can small states in principle uh, have a capacity to be uh, diffusers or models. Um, the third question that arose in uh, in reflecting <clears throat> on Everett's paper was, what's the di difference between diplomacy and diffusion or transfer? And that's because uh, uh, larded through the paper, but in the other work that Everett was was referring to, um, there uh, there's discussion about the diplomatic role or the kind of diplomatic initiatives undertaken by these states and I, I began to think well what you know when government when small states are involved in diplomacy how is that different if at all and what are the distinctions between what we consider to be diplomacy and what we consider to be diffusion or transfer in the diffusion literature mostly of course the idea is that policymakers in 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 non in areas that are not connected to foreign affairs or military power uh, more in the areas of economy or social policy will borrow models or, or instruments or, or policy paradigms from other countries because they work or because they're ideologically amenable or, or, um, or, or attractive. Um, so uh, the, the, the areas of diplomacy tend to be more in the international relations, the representation of the state uh, internationally and around military issues. But it struck me that maybe we need to tease that out and, and, uh, and, and pull it apart to think about maybe there's more of a continuum rather than a, a, a than a dichotomy or a um, uh, a, uh, a binary between a diplomacy and diffusion. So when we think about this question, of course, all states have relations with each other. And that's typically what we think of as diplomacy. Uh, so diplomacy is representation and communication of state interests to other states. Um, and in some instances, however, it may shade off into what we would think of as transfer, the transfer of models or the transfer transfer of instruments or the transfer of, of interests so that get encapsulated in policy. So I was thinking about this. So some examples um, that are that I think most people would agree are, are examples of diplomacy, but have a, tr um, a transfer element to them. 
in the sense that there may be some policy model that's embedded in the di diplomatic representation. So one of them, uh, probably the softest, um, and, and everyone referred to soft power, one of the uh, ways in which diplomacy can also be a bit of transfer is when you see countries ob either obliquely supporting or condemning uh, the behaviors or activities of other states, and in so doing, are in a, not inadvertently, but uh, but at the same time, uh, simultaneously, um, condemning or supporting certain models. So when we have the United States and Biden administration over the last few days uh, criticizing the coup in Myanmar, um, that becomes not just a critique of the coup in Myanmar, a diplomatic representation, but of course it becomes uh, obliquely or even even quite obviously. Uh, a critique of non-democratic practices and consequently a support for a democratically elected government and the democratic system of governance that elected that, uh, that government. And governments do this all the time uh, in terms of representations on human rights, uh, admonishments um, about certain military maneuvers that are being undertaken by China, for example, in the South China Sea, and on and on and on. So we think of these as diplomatic representations, where one state will say to another, what you've just done in a coup or some kind of military incursion or installation is wrong. But embedded in that statement, of course, is a value position with respect to appropriate state behavior. And so it becomes, in a sense, a kind of oblique form of transfer. Now, the other, uh, a second interesting way in which um, uh, diplomacy can end up uh, effectively being a kind of transfer, and when we think about small states particularly, they're typically weak uh, in terms of international relations. Small states of small populations, in principle, goes back to the first question, small capacities, small geographic space, and consequently small militaries, and they're, uh, they fear bullies. They fear being the uh, um, the uh, the objects of uh, of uh, actions taken by larger states on the international scene. So most small states are middle powers, and this comes from I guess my own background as a Canadian. Um, most small states and and uh, and middle powers uh, really have a, a strong support for a rules based international system <clears throat> because uh, they typically do better uh, in a rules based regime than they do in uh, the jostling of uh, the power politics at, at the level of international relations because they by definition don't have much power. Uh, so this becomes a form of roundabout transfer. Canada. Uh, is very active uh, in supporting international institutions and the UN and, you know, the joke in Canadian international relations studies is that uh, there isn't a conference or an international organization that Canada doesn't want to join because it has a long-standing interest in maintaining uh, this thicket of international rules and regulations and international conferences and and treaties and all of the rest of that because they bind, they end up binding the large powers into effectively what is an international rule of law. Um, so, uh, and this becomes an inadvertent form of transfer because uh, if trade, for example, becomes an object of WTO rules, if you have one seat on the WTO and you can, you can argue on, uh, for, for, for an international organization like that, then that international organization becomes a mechanism of transfer of an international regime that actually benefits a small state and ends up binding or compromising the, uh, the power of the larger states. Uh, one example, going back to Qatar, is uh, the Doha Forum. This is a, an international policy summit that has been hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Qatar for 20 years. And we um, it's ongoing now in a virtual format. And just um, uh, recently, in the last few days, we had um, a, a, a panel for the Doha Forum which uh, publicized uh, the release of the Doha Forum report. Uh, the Doha Forum each year releases a report, and the report this time uh, is about uh, the, um, the challenges to multilateral governance and making a plea for a roadmap going forward to revitalize international institutions. So this is a small country that is hosting a policy, an international policy forum that typically would have had people coming. It's kind of a, a Davos in the desert kind of model, bringing the great and the good and international representatives, et cetera, uh, here to talk uh, about global policy issues and then make a pitch for the uh, the role of the small state. And, and in this report, 
uh, issue just um, in December, uh, late December, there's, a, there's an argument in favor of a roadmap toward a revitalized international global system. So here's a small state using its leverage uh, to try to uh, uh, induce or uh, to encourage a renovation in, in an international global system that will ultimately benefit with the small state. And it's actually making a case for a particular kind of roadmap and a particular kind of renovation. Uh, and if, if, uh, if that gets accepted, then Qatar, through the Doha Forum, will have transferred some of its ideas and some of its interests into the global architecture of international institutions. Um, of course, then we can get into things like public diplomacy. Uh, one could argue, and again, this is mentioned in, uh, in, in Evren's remarks, uh, FIFA, uh, the World Cup, which will be happening next year in Qatar, is a, is, you know, a massive effort of international public diplomacy to uh, increase the uh, the image of the country uh, globally first time that the uh, the world cup has been held in a in a, in a um, arab state muslim state in the region so uh, that is a, a you know public diplomacy is a way of not necessarily transferring but at least creating um, a an image of of a, of a of a small country that is hopefully favorable and which consequently can end up uh, providing leverage for the diffusion of certain ideas or, or practices or at least lowering what uh, negative perceptions of, of that, uh, that country. And then finally, and this is where it gets a bit more muscular and far from soft diplomacy, but hard uh, diplomacy or hard international behaviors when you have counterintelligence, um, activities and uh, regime support or destabilization. And that's transfer with a capital T in a very muscular form of transfer. Uh, and again, uh, Everett mentioned some of the activities and, and the, the blockade hinged on uh, disagreements uh, among, the, among the Gulf, among the GCC states about uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring and the Muslim Brotherhood and different factions. Uh, within different Arab states and uh, and how that should be played and supported. And so different states were supporting often different sides in, in the Arab Spring conflicts and regime changes. But of course, um, that, this has been true of, uh, of other countries. The United States um, has routinely interfered uh, in, uh, in elections uh, uh, around the world and, uh, and and so have regimes like Russia as far as we know and now with uh, the possibilities of interventions in elections uh, the Chinese and everybody else is piling on so these are forms of uh, counterintelligence that are far removed from soft diplomacy but they're part of a species of, of, of activities that states um, take on uh, to try to and even small states in the GCC example take on in order to further their national interests but it could very much becomes a uh, a mechanism of transfer uh, in terms of supporting the evolution of different regimes wherever they may be and wherever your interests might lie so that's the third question about what's the difference uh, or what are the relationships between diplomacy and diffusion uh, fourth and fifth question the fourth question is maybe rather than thinking about small states as monads, as single actors, what about thinking about small state clusters? And again, this was stimulated by Everett's paper. If we think of the GCC as a group of six states, um, they form a cluster and a small ecosystem of transfer, both within themselves, within that association of states, but between that association, the GCC and, and others. So in this respect, we're not thinking about small states as single actors, but subsystems of small states. The GCC is probably one of the best examples of that. Um, but um, subsystems of, of states that interact with each other for, for the purpose of coordination and in, in principle coordination and sharing. Now, the GCC, is, as Evren said, has had a an unhappy history, perhaps, of, uh, of ruptures and breaks, but its inspiration is to do exactly that, to bring states together, here, six small states, so that they can coordinate and share and transfer and diffuse uh, their, their policy models. So that takes us to a different level, and it becomes a little more interesting than just thinking about what Singapore or Denmark or New Zealand or South Korea uh, or Luxembourg or, or Qatar may be doing, but we, it, it puts each one of those small states perhaps in a, an ecosystem or cluster of other states, some, in some cases other small states, 
and we can begin thinking about the dynamics uh, differently. Uh, so I was thinking about this, and there are lots and lots of regional associations, which, and we should be careful here, often mix large with small, small conventionally defined. So there's the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, which uh, I believe the membership is 57 states, and of course includes Indonesia, one of the largest countries in the world, and you know Qatar and Kuwait and Bahrain, very small states. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it's a configuration of, of large and small with, a, um, with an inspiration to join around some set of characteristics, in this case, Islamic cooperation. The Caribbean, uh, I did a quick scan. The Caribbean is festooned with, um, with organizations, and, and the Caribbean states are, are, are I think, would, would meet the definition of small states. There's CARICOM, the Caribbean community, there's the Association of Caribbean States. There's the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, CELAC. Um, and uh, there are also ones designated specifically for policy. Uh, the Caribbean Development Bank, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, the Caribbean Public Health Agency. So here's an instance of small, in most instances, most of these examples, small states interacting with each other and the diffusion dynamics, I think, are going to be different. The cool thing, though, is that even in a group of small states, uh, one or another of those small states will end up being a, a large state or disproportionately influential within its cluster. So that, um, I'm not, I don't know the Caribbean area, but one or Jamaica may end up being more influential in the Caribbean configuration, uh, even though it's typically a small state when compared to the rest of the world. KSA, Saudi Arabia is probably, even though it's got a population of 34 million, is probably still a small state in, in most people's conventional understandings, but it's a big state within the context of GCC. So that you know makes us rethink, I think, a little bit what we mean by small and large states. And finally, uh, the uh, the fifth question, um, are small states likely to be more or less important in transfer and diffusion in the future? And I was trying to think this through, and again, I mean, we could have a huge discussion about that, obviously, but um, one way of coming at this is to try to imagine how tight or loose global systems are in terms of transfer and particularly around models of governance or policy and standards. Um, so, you know, the during the heyday of the so-called Washington Consensus, the U.S. and Western-dominated international institutions uh, accounted for the bulk of economic and military power, and you could have an, an international, and they're, you know, dominated international organization. Excuse me. So, you know, that's a, that's a system, a model, where I think the international system was very tight. And so tr flows, transfer flows, tended to be north-south and tended to emanate from European, North American, American models, more or less. And small states would have been completely overshadowed. Now, here's a newsflash. Of course, we're in a, we're in a multipolar world now. Uh, the BRICS, Brazil being one of them, um, uh, China. Uh, Russia may be less so, uh, all of, you know, and, and there's, the BRICS have had, you know, a bumpy road in the last number of years, China, you know, maybe less so. Um, so what we've seen is a decline of, of American hegemony and, and, the, uh, and the hegemony of the West. So there's, there's possibly more looseness in a multipolar world and, and possibly more spaces for smaller states to exercise um, uh, uh, some degree of influence or some degree of transfer. Um, but I would go back to uh, to the points I was making about the, the the general basis upon which small states can exercise their influence. They not only do you need a relatively looser structure, where without a single dominant model, where where people are prepared to look at Qatar or Singapore or New Zealand, because they may have ideas or models that work, but uh, there need those, those small countries need to be positioned to have a model that works or positioned in such a way to, to be of use or be relevant to the still remaining international actors. So going back to GCC, once the hydrocarbons become less and less strategically important, um, that in itself as a single factor would, would uh, almost by definition reduce the role 
that the small GCC states could play. And of course, that's one of the reasons that countries like Qatar, but the others as well, are trying to position themselves for a post-hydrocarbon world and, uh, and position themselves as leaders in certain areas of policy so that despite their size, they might still be able to uh, plausibly claim that their um, models of diffusion and transfer that should be paid attention to. And I will end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Les, for this uh, very insightful uh, questions for us to move even uh, forward our uh, reflections about the role of small states in uh, uh, policy transfer, fusion, and development cooperation. Uh, these are very interesting uh, uh, questions. Uh, it's also a very uh, good starting point. As we mentioned previously in this, this panel, we don't have much uh research on uh, this type of uh states uh so these are this is a very good starting point for everyone who's interested on doing this uh research on small states and policy um uh transfer uh, and development uh cooperation um and something that we have been uh discussing in this uh, past weeks of uh of uh, of the conference is uh, uh, this the the um, the fact that uh, so far in the past years we have been studying uh, pretty much the kind of same objects, so uh, northern models that are being transferred among uh, northern countries or uh, models that have been uh, diffused by international organizations as best practices, and uh, more more recently we started to include also. Uh, transfers from south south to south uh, countries or south to south uh, governments and uh, uh, it's there's still so much to be explored and uh, uh, this uh, panel is also and your questions and the work of uh, Evren uh, which brings this uh, uh, very insightful empirical uh, evidences uh, this is uh, um, uh, a sort of a, a, an invitation to new researchers and new researches that uh, uh, of uh, empirical objects uh, that uh, can be explored uh, in order to enrich our uh, discussions and our knowledge uh, and the, the, and, and uh, show us even more this uh, diversity of practices processes and agents uh, power uh, in policy transfer so uh, i was very I, i'm i'm very happy with everything that has been uh, discussed today uh, i wanted to uh, uh, I, I, i'm not making uh, comments to to the the, the paper of uh, evren uh, uh, i just wanted to to because it, it it has already been published I just wanted uh, to uh, to say that I liked it a lot uh, the paper uh, because it uh, it's it informed us these tensions uh, between the the the, co the cooperation among uh, uh, this uh, the Gulf countries and uh, the one thing that I missed in the paper and I would encourage uh, everyone to continue further. Uh, developing uh, this uh, kind of uh, research is uh, the, uh, the the public policies that are being shared or the solutions for public problems that is being shared in the region. I was very interested when you you talked about uh, food security and uh, the type of solutions that have been uh, 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 discussed uh, for uh, Qatar. And I wanted to uh, hear more and I wanted to find out more. I think this is going to be very interesting for the area as a whole about uh, what is being shared. What is the type of uh, problems, the type of uh, public policy solutions that circulate among these countries? Who are the main um, uh, uh, models? Uh, why, uh, how are these being transferred and so on and so on. Uh, so this is a, a very interesting avenue uh, for research, and I will, of course, encourage you uh, to to continue on this. I know you are very busy with uh, multiple uh, projects, which is uh, great. But uh, I think this is uh, something that we we all would benefit uh, to uh, of uh, understanding better. 
Um, uh, so I, I don't know if there is a, there are any questions from uh, the audience, uh, but uh, if uh, if there is any question, please write down in the YouTube chat. I will now give the word back to uh, Evren for him to make uh, some uh, reflections on what have been said. Uh, Evren, if you can uh, discuss in briefly in maybe five minutes, uh, uh, and then we can, uh, if there are any questions from the audience, we can take them. Otherwise, we can uh, start concluding the this panel. Uh Thank you so much, uh, dear Professor Pal and dear Professor uh, Osmani, for 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 your remarks. And um, I really appreciate the kind of the extent and the depth of uh, the uh, reflections on the paper. Uh, I believe all the five points that have been raised are, uh, I mean, equally important. Although I believe the uh, the one I really want to pursue this further and I'm just thinking that if I want to pursue this further perhaps the uh, the issue of uh, diplomacy and diffusion I believe that it's, it's critically important because Qatar has been engaging uh, as a small state as you know a lot of mediation in the region and uh, those um, kind of experiences also I believe quite important in informing uh, future regional conflicts and how they can be resolved, right? So um, that that's one area. And when we talk about diplomacy, of course, as um, uh, uh, Professor Pell mentioned, it's the, it's no longer the state diplomacy or the, uh, the, uh, the foreign diplomacy or like diplomacy at a high level or high politics level. It's also the public diplomacy and public diplomacy has so many different variants. Uh, sometimes these variants totally bypass the state and uh, create many forms of uh, interaction uh, across communities and even in a translocal ways and uh, capacity buildings and sometimes about youth, uh, sometimes about uh, collaboration. And uh, I, I was also even thinking that, for instance, like um, uh, similarly about this, uh, the, because the, the um, one of the, I think the second question was about uh, like, what does the, uh, what does this small state offer in terms of a model for transfer? Uh, perhaps a good uh, area for us to experiment and uh, scrutinize in the next uh, uh, little while is, is about uh, sports management and how like the health policies, especially vis-a-vis -vis the sports events and hosting big events. And like, for instance, uh, what did the World Cup mean to South Africa? Uh, like, for instance, how uh, certain uh, ameliorations and kind of improvements in their security systems through for the World Cup also state uh, state like a uh, kind of like a uh, after the World Cup and improved certain uh, decreasing of criminal crime rates etc or Brazil uh, what their experience in terms of hosting uh, these uh, events I believe that um, diplomatically and also um, at a societal level at an economic level these are quite important so uh, especially looking at uh, or Russia is also another case. Uh, I believe that uh, that can be studied uh, at different levels. And um, and thank you so much for all these comments. I really do appreciate. I really want to write further on this. And uh, and I believe the question of uh, the public policies and uh, the, the the problems and the different actors and mechanisms of dealing with these problems is very important. Uh, in the case of Qatar, I guess the, when it comes to uh, food security, it is still quite uh, state-sponsored because most of the farms that are owned by Qataris that are op operational, uh, they haven't done this in their first trials. I visited most of them and uh, the commonality of most of the farms right now that are operating, utilizing really like cutting-edge technologies of irrigation uh, and farming, uh, they, they all say the same thing. It's their fourth or the fifth trial, and uh, it has been very difficult for them. Uh, although the state gives subsidies, they cannot keep doing it, you know. So there is an important state support, but there is also, uh, uh, I believe, uh, an important kind of like um, knowledge, uh, accumulation of knowledge 
uh, or maybe for the future, it's more about knowledge transfer, right? That's going to be play, playing an important role because in order to have more food secure uh, country or produce your own, uh, it's not just a matter of state providing the tools, but it's also about learning um, different uh, knowledge about what you do, right? Uh, um, the kind of soil or different technicalities, different irrigation techniques and different uh, use of different approaches and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, of course, same thing could be thought of in terms of uh, the foreign labor. Uh, if you look at the, the Gulf since 2013 with the new law, you always see a kind of a new uh, advancement about uh, protection of foreign workers, especially blue-colored workers, mostly from coming from South Asian countries. Uh, and why certain countries are uh, like undertaking these improvements earlier but whereas some others are quite late uh, in terms of uh, like uh, starting these uh, uh, like improvements in the uh, living and um, other conditions of uh, foreign workers. So uh, there are differences. So I believe that um, diplomacy and diffusion are, they need to be studied in more depth in order to understand uh, the different behavior of these countries. Uh, for instance, opening your country for uh, sale or purchase of uh, real estate. Uh, it's one of the most interesting areas that I believe uh, uh, that should be studied, the policies behind it. So, um, yes, thank you so much for the remarks. I really appreciate and I will keep thinking and hopefully writing about this and attending more of your events in the future. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Evren, for uh, this uh, uh, this uh, reactions to the to the, the the reflections and questions we made. Uh, let me see if there is anything from the chat. Uh, I think so far uh, we don't have any questions. So, uh, if we don't have any questions, uh, I'm we can start concluding uh, what we learned from this panel uh, a lot about uh, small states uh, policy diffusion and development cooperation uh, we also learned that uh, we need to have a paper on this topic uh, maybe uh, les and Evan we can discuss it uh, later on it will be great a lot of material a lot of reflections uh, so it was great to be here today to uh, to host uh, this uh, panel for the second international conference on policy diffusion and development cooperation. Uh, I really think that this uh, reflection was something that uh, is still missing uh, in the literature and will be very important for us to uh, uh, enlarge our uh, knowledge on different cases about small states and the dynamics of diffusion transfer circulation uh, of the state. So thank you very much uh, for being here uh, today with us. Uh, thank you, um, Professor Paul, Professor uh, Evren. Uh, it was great to, uh, to uh, be with you and to have your contributions. Uh, so this panel is going to be uh, available uh, on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to uh, subscribe and uh, to like uh, the video and uh, keep following us in the next uh, days and weeks uh, until March uh, in the, the, the following panels of the conference uh, here. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and I wish you all a great day or a, a great evening depending on where you are. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thanks, Osmani.